Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Factor V Expression in XPHO Cells, presented by Dr. Laurent Monnier, Associate Professor, Molecular Medicine, Scripps Research Institute. I'm Christy Jewell of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. This presentation is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. This presentation you are about to see was previously recorded, but I would like to remind you that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Dr. Monnier will answer the questions via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Laurent Monnier, Associate Professor, Molecular Medicine and Scripps Research Institute. Dr. Monnier holds a PhD in thrombosis and hemostasis from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He has worked in a variety of roles over nearly 20 years at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, most recently as a tenured associate professor. His recent work includes developing a targeted therapy for acute traumatic bleeding. Dr. Monnier will now begin his presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to share with you tonight um, so, some of our experiences um, with the XP uh, Cho cell system. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Bill G. Joseph, who, who will be who done most of the work that uh, I, I'll be presenting. And also, um, I'd like to mention that these studies were done in uh, collaboration with Hematerics and as well uh, with Thermo Fisher, and I'd like to thank them very much for all their contributions that they made and help that they gave us. Um, just as a way of a background, um, my lab at, uh, at Scripps is a basic academic lab. Um, I'm interested in uh, blood coagulation uh, proteins, and my specialty is a stru structure function of uh, blood coagulation proteins. We generally try to um, engineer proteins so that they have beneficial activities either in uh, situations of bleeding, of, in situations of thrombosis, or in situations where, where coagulation and inflammation uh, coincide, so it's, uh, such as sepsis or um, other inflammatory diseases. A, a, a couple of years ago, we became really interested in um, bleeding diseases, and, and, and because we figured that there's really not that much out there uh, in way of uh, treating bleeding diseases and an understanding of the mechanisms of bleeding. Um, in particular, we came, became interested in uh, acute traumatic bleeding um, as a way of, of, of mechanism, but also because there are no, it's a major clinical problem, but there are currently uh, very little um, suitable treatment options. The available pro hemostatics that are out on the market um, they're, they're very good at stopping bleeding, but they also come with a risk of uh, thrombosis, and especially in multi-symptom, multifactorial traumatic bleeding, um, they carry an, an unacceptable high risk of uh, thrombosis with them. So when we were working on trying to figure out, okay, what mechanisms are involved in traumatic bleeding, we realized that we had a uh, engineered uh, coagulation factor V molecule that had properties that were very beneficial or are deemed to be very beneficial in, in the situation of acute traumatic bleeding. And so we proposed that, that this engineered factor V molecule uh, could actually be a target therapy for acute traumatic bleeding. Um, so we went on um, in the lab in mouse models to show e efficacy of this model, um, and we showed that it, um, it reduced bleeding and acute trauma. It prevented acute traumatic coagulopathy to um, develop, uh, which is a consequence of acute shock. Um, it works in hemophilic bleeding, and in, it stops bleeding associated with uh, direct oral anticoagulants um, and a bunch of other bleeding um, indications. So at that point, we, 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 for ourselves, we were convinced that, you know, the, the molecule actually works or has a chance of working, at least in these mouse models. Um, but we, we, 
we hit, we're hit with another problem, is, and, and, and that is, well, how are you going to produce it? So if you're thinking about translational or, or preclinical development, how are you going to make this molecule? And so the goal of this presentation and, and, and the goal of this whole uh, project was to evaluate the feasibility of uh, a preclinical slash commercial skill production platform um, for recombinant factor V. And the reason why that was a little um, uncertain or at least carried some risk with it is that there's currently no um, precedent for commercial production um, of recombinant factor V, at least not in the public domain. And it's a big molecule. It's uh, over 2,000 amino acids. It's heavily glycosylated, has a molecular weight of about, uh, a little over 300,000 um, uh, Dalton. Uh, there are multiple disulfide bridges, and the plasma concentration is in the order of 10 micrograms per milliliter. Now, there, there, there is a homologous protein, factor eight, which is also a coagulation factor that is um, being commercially produced by numerous companies as a treatment for uh, hemophilia A. Um, and so, so there are some similarities um, in, in, in that that is possible, but you have to realize that the plasma concentration of factor eight um, is, is at least tenfold lower. So if you think that, well, you, you need to achieve about equal dosing as plasma levels, then, you know, we, we, we needed to be able to show that our production could um, be 10 times as good as, as, as what is out there for factor eight. Now, in order to simplify um, the, the expression of this recombinant protein, um, a part of the B domain, uh, which is indicated here at the bottom, is deleted. And that, that, that makes a big difference because it's, it, it truncates the, the protein by about 700 amino acids. It takes about, away about 25 glycosylation sites. And after activation by the coagulation cascade or in the test tube, after, uh, after purification, before administration, um, th this whole B domain is cleaved out anyway, so you still end up with the same um, normal activated factor V. So this is where we were when we started this project. Um, our lab scale production of factor V, um, we were using um, a so-called PED vector, which is a bisestronic uh, vector with a DHFR. It's um, developed in 19, or well, published in 1991 uh, by Randy Kaufman, who works at the Burnham Institute. Um, the production was done in adherent BHK cells, um, which came from Dr. Kamir, and, and typically we had an expression level of one to two milligrams per liter. Um, not great, but enough to, do, uh, to purify a few milligrams for, air for mouse studies. Um, so really when we started this project, the basic questions were, well, can we reach to um, an expression goal of about 50 milligrams per liter? Uh, given that we're an academic lab, that not everything is perfect, if we reach the 50 milligrams per liter, then uh, more professional uh, commercial entities will have um, room to optimize that further to what will be considered a viable um, uh, pr production um, uh, yield. But, but, but that presented us with questions. Well, how are we going to start? Uh, which vector are we going to use? Uh, and, and which cells are we going to use? Um, we, we had dabbled a little bit ar uh, around before uh, with PC uh, DNA 3.1 and uh, adherent HEC 293 cells, which are, uh, I mean, in which we basically express all our coag other coagulation proteins, and that was a complete and utter failure. We didn't see any expression. So, to be honest, I was a little hesitant uh, when we started this. Now, luckily, um, and, and, and thanks to Terma Fischer, um, we were able to make some initial headway. And, and so the plan was to, to try transient trans, trans, transfection in the XPTO and in the XP293 uh, system to kind of see which, which cell line would be most uh, suitable. And then as for vectors, um, and, and I must admit this was something that I wasn't aware of until it was pointed out to me, is that the PC DNA 3.1 vector that we use in all our um, academic expression um, um, system actually has a truncated CMV promoter. So the first thing that, that was suggested is, well, you, you got to try the, the sorry, PC DNA 3.3 or 3.4 that have a full length CMV promoter. And then in addition, the PC DNA 3.4 also has what they call a, a Woodchuck post transcriptional regulatory element um, that, that further stabilizes messenger RNA. So, Okay, well, we'll give it a try. So we got the PC DNA 3.4, um, put in the construct, 
and, and gave it a try. And much to our um, excitement and enjoyment, um, the first try in the XP Cho, which is as shown on, on, the, on the left here, um, really improved expression compared to what we're used to seeing in our, in our BHK uh, cell line that is shown all the way on the left. Um, so here's an example of, of, of um, the culture soup harvested at either at day eight or at day 10 um, using the PCDNA 3.4 vector and compared to our uh, PED vector that we were used um, to using, which um, basically did not improve expression of, um, above the uh, BHK cells. So th 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 this was really intriguing, and so we were wondering, well, wh what is it in this vector that's really so good? And, and the other problem is that because the protein is so big, we were hitting, uh, we were a little over 10 KB, and we were worried that the plasmid became too big. So we decided, okay, let's take this woodchuck element out there and see if, does that really make a difference? So on the right side, you see um, the comparison of PCDNA 3.3 versus 3.4. Uh, this is done in an adherent Cho K1 cells. Um, but as you can see, uh, the, 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 the woodchuck element really seems to make a difference. Even if it's only in the order of about two times, um, there is a consistent uh, improved in expression when that element is, uh, is present. So that was great. So now we had confidence that this PCDNA 3.4 um, is capable of a, at least greatly improving expression, um, which brought us to our next question, what cells should we use? So this is, again, the left side, the same XP Cho S cells. Um, this is derived from uh, 30 um, ml cultures, I believe. And on the, on the right side is the same um, vectors and uh, done at the same time in the XP293 cells. And there is nothing there, or very little there. So this explains why our dabbling with the PCDNA 3.1 and the hand hack was um, such an utter failure. Why this difference occurs, I have no idea. I can't I can tell you. Um, but, but it is consistent, and, and so apparently there's something in the XP Cho cells that, that for this particular protein works a lot better. So that's great. So now we have a cell line that is, um, um, that is feasible to, um, to use that expresses a, a, a number of times better. Um, so how can we improve this? <laughs> so the next step is that, um, well, the, 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 if, if you read the manual, there, there are these two uh, methods, or, or, or three methods maybe, for, for transfection and for culturing. The, the so-called standard protocol, um, where feed is given on day one, and the culture temperature is uh, 37 degrees, and, and the so-called max, max titer protocol, um, where there's a, an additional feed at day five, and, and the temperature after transfection is lower to 32 degrees. So I asked, well, does that really make a difference? And as you can see here, yes, it makes a difference. If you use the, the, the culture temperature at 32 degrees, you, you get, again, a um, little less than a two-fold improved expression. So good. So, so although we couldn't be sure that it's the temperature or versus, versus the feet, um, certainly something to keep in mind. The other thing that was really interesting is that, and I don't know if you have noticed the pattern, is that these were harvested around day seven, day eight, but as you go on with later harvest date, the, the activity of the protein decreased. So we're wondering, well, maybe we're too late in harvesting. Maybe there's something going on that's decreasing the protein. Let's do a time course and let's see what's happening. Well, when, when we did the time course, and this is shown here in the XP Cho, uh, transient transfection, in this case, we used the PCDNA 3.4 with the MAX protocol and the culturing at 32 degrees. You see that there's a, a very rapid um, increase in, in expression um, up to a, about day five. And in black, you see the activity, and in the open symbols, it's the antigen. And generally, activity and antigen uh, coincide quite well uh, up to, to about day five. What's amazing is if you look at the expression level. So now we're hitting 80 milligrams per liter in this uh, relatively unoptimized um, system. And so we already reached our initial goal that we thought was really high of 50 milligrams um, per liter. Now, if you look at what's going on, so obviously after day, starting at day four, but after day five, something is going on that is degrading the protein. And you can see that on the, on the rest of the blood, um, on the right side, in the, in, the, in the bar on top, that's our protein of interest. That's what we want. 
And so you see the accumulation of degradation um, products. But um, you can always harvest a little earlier before the degradation takes place. We can figure this out later. Um, th these data were so um, exciting to us that we, we, we decided, okay, let's go ahead, let's see if we can make a stable cell line out of this. And so we used the, 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 the XPHOS cell um, to give it a try and, and, and make stables. The, the PCDNA 3.4 has a neomycin selection cassette in there. Um, so what we did is we did, we did the transfection, um, 24 hours, put the selection media on there, let the pool select for about two weeks, and then after two weeks we did dilution cloning to, to get our monoclonal cell line. We tried it a few times, but unfortunately um, we were not successful in getting any good expressing clones. Why, why is that? Well, we thought maybe um, our, 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 you, know, the, you, you pick up the fastest, in, in this pool, you, you, you pick up the fastest growing cells. Maybe if, if the cells need to express this protein, it gives them a growth disadvantage. So maybe we're just outgrowing the pool. So we changed our approach a little bit. So we did the transfection and, and then decided to do the dilution cloning and the selection at the same time. Um, it's an inefficient pro uh, process. We, we did about 10 plates. Um, a lot of empty wells were, were the results. But that way, um, at least if you have a slow glowing clone, um, that is a high producer, you, you, you'll capture it right from the beginning. As you can see from the 10 plates, we had, I don't know, what is that, about 20, 20 clones that were um, uh, interesting, and one that with the red circle um, was actually the, the highest expressing clone. And so I'll talk more about that particular clone. I just wanted to make the um, uh, remark that there, there's a solution for this, and um, that's uh, doing the, 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 the selection in semi-solid media. And it worked really well, and, and that's shown on, on, the, on the right. Um, the problem is that we didn't have an automated clone picker, um, so, so we were limited to, to, to letting the clones grow to a certain size so that we could pick them up um, by eye. The other problem is that with the automated clone picker, um, you can use a fluorescent antibody that kind of binds to your protein of interest and forms a halo uh, around the clone. So you can select for high expressing clones versus low expressing clones. And I think if you have that technique um, developed or if you have an antibody that works with that, um, that then this is a really good uh, solution um, for this overgrowing of the pools. Um, nevertheless, uh, for us I worked at just um, doing the dilution cloning uh, and the selection at the same time. So we, picked, we went on with this clone C4. Um, we did all the steps that you're supposed to do, um, made sure it was monoclonal, did a second subcloning. Um, we tested that it was expressing for at least uh, 30 passages, um, made sure there was no contamination, did the, the banking, et cetera. But the bottom line is that when we looked at it um, in a 30 ml culture, um, oh yeah, and I should mention that um, because we are a castrapped academic lab, um, we decided to go with the freestyle show media instead of the um, little bit uh, less budget-friendly ex um, expression media that is typically used in the transient uh, transactions. Um, nevertheless, we, 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 we saw a similar pattern um, as that we saw with the transients before. Um, they express really well up to about day three, day four, and after that the um, expression levels uh, drop. They average expression levels now and, and um, were about 30 milligrams per liter, which is a little lower than the highest that we saw in the transient, but still very good. And so we were trying uh, different ways with batch feeding and see if it could you know, stretch out its expression time uh, and get the levels up. And so that's shown on the right. Um, we decided to, to replace the medium every uh, three days, 50% of the media replaced, and then uh, do that um, in subsequent days. And at least for a couple of days, we, we, we were successful to in, increase production. We even went up to 150 milligrams per liter. Um, but, but then I guess the, the waste products in the culture took over. And I must admit, we're not measuring uh, ammonia, glucose, uh, oxygen levels. Um, we're just not set out for that. But this gave um, um, a really good feeling that we can achieve high expression um, in stably transfected XP Cho cells. However, the eureka moment for us came 
um, when we were going over the data again and say, hey, how can we improve this now further? And then um, we realized that why don't we give it a try at 32 degrees? I mean, that's, that's the max protocol that showed that huge increase in the, um, in the transient. Um, why wouldn't that work in the stable as well? So what you, what you see here is the, uh, the, the time course of the expression, either at 37 degrees of the stable clone in green or at 32 degrees in the, um, uh, of the stable clone in, in red. Uh, and as you can see, there's a huge difference for this particular clone. And um, since we only selected the few clones and, and, and continued only one, I don't know if this is specific for this particular clone or if we can uh, generally extrapolate this to, to other proteins or other clones as well. Um, but, but for us, this was a, a, a huge breakthrough. Um, we set out to try to uh, express 50 milligrams per liter. Now we can uh, routinely achieve um, 100, 150 milligrams per liter um, without um, too much problems. The other thing that's really interesting is if you remember in the transient, we had this problem with the degradation and, and all these degradation products that were formed. And as you can see here, uh, unless you get to the really end of the curve, uh, the, the, the amount of the degradation products is, is a lot less. And so this is really um, clean. So in conclusion, um, for us, this uh, transient transfection in the XPCHO and the XP293 um, expression systems prov provided a robust screening method uh, for the initial selection of which expression vector to use and which cell line uh, to use. And the occurring uh, expression levels after transient transfection they, uh, they prompted us to, to spend the effort and time to generate a, a stable cell line. And the expression levels of factor five in this stable transfected XPCHO S cell exceeded uh, expectation and provide a high level of confidence that the commercial scale production of factor five in XPCHO S cells uh, is feasible. And certainly with further additional optimization, um, it should be um, uh, no problem. I think on, on that part, it's important to note that a fully documented uh, GMP-banked XPCHO S cell is now uh, available, and also that a recently released XPCHO stable production media um, is available that is um, more in the same price class as the freestyle show compared to the uh, expression media, which for us, that's important. Um, I, didn't, I didn't show you the data because it's still too preliminary in my view, uh, but we, we have tried some uh, expression with our stable clone in the stable expression media, and it um, certainly provides a, a big increase compared to the freestyle medium, uh, and it's very sim similar in expression levels uh, compared to the um, expression media that's used in entrenchment. So with that, I'd like to thank um, Thermo Fisher for their help uh, along the way, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. A big thank you goes out to Dr. Monnier for his excellent presentation. Now, if you do have any questions you would like to ask Dr. Monnier, please type them into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Dr. Monnier will be answering questions via the email address you provided at the time of registration. I would like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. You will now be redirected to the registration page of our next summer official webinar, XB293, New Tools for Structural Biology and Difficult to Express Proteins, presented by Dr. John Zamuda, Director of Cell Biology, Life Sciences Solutions Group, Thermo Fisher Scientific. This event will broadcast on December 10th at 8 a.m. Pacific time. That's all for now, and we hope to see you there.